Hello, and welcome to our panel discussion on magnets. I'm happy to introduce our panel, Gwen Spicer. Hello, I'm pleased to be here. Pierre-Luc Bouillet. And myself, Laura McClure. Hello. We'll begin our discussion today with safety. Rare earth magnets must be handled with safety in mind, so please make sure you handle with care and use the proper safety equipment. To safely handle strong magnets, you need to wear goggles and gloves. Goggles are very important because magnets tend to shatter uh, if they are put together accidentally. It's also important to wear gloves. Um, for example, if your hand gets stuck between two strong magnets, gloves will help you to pull off your hand and reduce the risk of injuries. Next, we'll talk about the storage of magnets. Um, storing magnets can be challenging. And Gwen is now going to talk about the challenges of storing magnets. Um, yeah, this is a, is really based on that um, each permanent magnet uh, has their own requirements. On, and uh, each need to be stored independently and then by size and grade. It turns out that each type of permanent magnet affects another type as well. Uh, this is especially true with the neodymium, which can easily demagnetize both the ferrite and alnico uh, magnet types. Also, it, it is the stronger neodymium that benefits most from having a separator. The separator reduces the accumulated strength of the full group of magnets within a stack. Any material can be used between magnets. Scraps of cardboard, foam, or even lengths of twill tape. Seen here, in the upper right portion of the slide, um, a solution from the National Museum of American Indian. I also like small boxes. They're really great as that they can be labeled with the necessary information, like grade and size. Uh, and for a specific project, uh, contact lenses cases were really perfect. Um, for I find that metal boxes um, which is what I use now, has two main advantages. One, the magnets actually stay in place, preventing any mechanical shock, uh, but also the cumulative flux is more concentrated. What I've, I have described are magnets that we actually use, which might be a one-time use. Uh, but what about magnets that are part of a many venue traveling exhibit? In this case, their storage is particularly critical. If these magnets are knocked or dropped during installation or deinstallation, their pull force will gradually reduce. And thus, the last venue, the success of that mount um, actually might be in jeopardy. Now we'll talk about the handling of rare earth magnets. An important part of handling is temperature. And each permanent magnet has a curry temperature or seen in this uh, diagram, the TC. Uh, and that identifies the temperature at which the material magnetism will be eliminated. Another temperature threshold is the maximum operating temperature, and that's seen here as the TMAX. Uh, and this is the temperature at which a magnet will still maintain its magnetic strength without diminishing uh, its power. Always be sure to stay below the magnet's maximum operating 
uh, temperature. And the neodymium in particular is very sensitive um, to this, um, to the, both the Curie and the maximum operating temperature. We are going to show you some useful tools that make handling magnets much easier. When possible, use plastic, aluminum, or wooden tools. Here are some examples that you can use with magnets. Here are some more examples of tools that are very useful to use with magnets. And these are, this is an image of some of Pierre Luc's favorite tools. Yes, um, those tools, um, I use those tools to work with a very strong magnet. Um, in my case, uh, uh, on a project, I needed to work with N52 magnets. Uh, so I needed uh, to have, um, uh, first of all, a polar detector uh, to know on which side of the magnets I am working. Um, after uh, I used um, the magnet puller that you can see with the orange handle, um, this tool is, uh, is very uh, useful to separate directly magnets one by one. Uh, after that, I also use uh, some Teflon wedge, which I, I designed to uh, smoothly um, slide magnets in place. It's also possible to make a wooden uh, wedge to, to make that kind of operation, but with Teflon, it's much easier and uh, it's easier to plan uh, between the, uh, each use. Uh, I also totally love my cer slice ceramic scissors, which are not non-magnetic. So if you need to put some interface uh, and cut them on place or cutting around magnets, it's, uh, it's wildly easier to use those tools. Uh, you will see a little video where I, can, I am handling magnets with uh, all this bunch of tools. Another great use for Teflon. Our next slide is about coatings and why coatings are so important on neodymium magnets. Um, there, it turns out the element neodymium is very reactive to oxidation, uh, leading to complete loss of its strength. Uh, therefore, the coating that surrounds this magnet is particularly critical to its function. It just so happens that the most of the possible coatings are all also archival. And even this standard three-layered plating as seen in this uh, graphic, the nickel copper nickel, uh, that is the most popular. Um, there are other types like uh, plastic and rubber on um, which the rubber is probably not um, archival. 
Other types are also just as good as I said, um, but I do recommend checking out the K and J magnetics video uh, where they tested several coating types in salt water uh, for a span of a week or so. Finally, here is a list of suppliers that we really like to buy magnets and magnets related supplies. And this list will also be available on the IMF website after the presentation. So now I'd like to open it up so we can have a little discussion about magnets. Mm -hmm. Pierre, look, do you have any questions for Gwen? Hmm. Um, yes. Uh, about all the all the storage uh, example uh, that, that you you showed up, um, um, you know the the small met metal box. Um, is there um, a limit of uh, ma magnetic uh, uh, magnetic power of a, a neodymium magnet to store it inside a metal box? Because uh, if I look at the N fifty two I was handling in the video. Um, those uh, those will be complicated to fit inside a metal box. Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. what would you recommend to to store those kind of strong magnets? So, the gauge of the metal is uh, critical mm -hmm. to the strength of any particular magnet or group of magnets that are used probably the most efficient metal that for your particular case would be um, mu metal, I believe it's called, but it's particularly, um, it is a metal that is specifically designed to capture and retain a magnetic flux. You actually have it in many of different electronics like your computer where there are magnets and they want to make sure that uh, one use of a magnet within the computer uh, doesn't affect what's going yeah. on and with another electronics sort of thing um, so that would be something if you're not, if you need a tighter um, space mm -hmm. around, but just adding a gap like you do in the sense that you have several inches surrounding or more surrounding your group of magnets, that is really the most economical. Mm -hmm. um, I just for uh, for those magnets. I just keep them inside the 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 shipping box I receive with the with the magnets, which was nicely built. Uh, it was uh, inside. It was a, a foam layer surrounded by galvanized steel layers, and then after inside a cardboard box. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was wondering because you know I, I think the the foam thickness and uh, the metal sheet thickness as an incidence on how the the box is um, um, functional for storing those magnets right and really the the altoid <laughs> boxes you know i have groups of s smaller mm -hmm. magnets and then also that you know you might order a large quantity for a particular project but then you still have a few left over and so that's kind of when those boxes are particularly useful mm -hmm. so that i can separate each you know by shape so i have a group of, of boxes just for discs a group for blocks on uh, and a group for cylinder you know where there it's a tall disc on uh, yeah. and then by grade 
and sizes so that each box has its own particular and so then I can quickly go, oh, do I have enough of this particular size for this project? And I can go yes or no, or, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you actually, in mentioning the box that you're using, being that it was what was shipped in is really, um, brings up sort of another topic in the sense that um most magnets are shipped or delivered to us with using ground transportation and so then they just need to make sure that the box is large enough and typically the group of they ensure that the group is in the center of the box um and this is also important for air transportation and this not that your your order of magnets is going to come by air but you might be uh, transporting a mount or an artifact that is mounted with magnets and so then you have to ensure that the your mount and its crate and all um follow the regulations of mm -hmm. air travel because in essence especially these strong neodymium magnets they see them as um you know hazardous materials yeah i made a i made a few tests uh, with um with the different interface uh between magnets and uh, different materials and i found uh, that uh, each time i'm using an interface or a barrier uh, i have a loss of the pull force um, particularly when i use a poly sewed um, sewed polyethylene uh, on a magnet to to make a barrier between uh, for example uh, once i had to install a uh, a giant roll of uh, of paper on the wall on a wall mount presentation and we install it with magnets and i use the same kind of n52 magnets i have right now but i put some layers of the uh, poly sewed su poly and uh, i found that i i had a loss each time i had a layer i have a loss on the pull for of the of the magnet right. Yeah, no, that that space, you know, is the field distance or sometimes called the gap or, you know, and yes, as the gap it increases the pull force, there's a, and depending on the size and the grade, um, that distant field distance uh, changes. However, I think I am I understanding that you use poly suede, like a yeah. poly. So it turns out with comp with pressure, there is another phenomenon that actually happens. Um, and this came out in a workshop that I did several years ago on um, I think it was 13, 2013 or 15, and where people were given different materials and found that the thicker poly suede had the same holding power as the control with nothing. So then what was going on? Well, it turns out there's another phenomenon of exchange of electrons and that is shown in the triboelectric series. Where in essence, materials are ranked by the ability to give or receive electrons. And if you have a material that are far apart, your artifact is one material and you're using a material as your like barrier or 
mm -hmm. um, material between the magnet, that actually can enhance the pull force or contributes an additional strength of the magnet. Yeah. Um, so in fact, in, so there, the interaction of materials um, is also contributing to the strength of the pull force of the magnet, which I find very exciting and interesting. Yeah, um, exactly. And more, more needs to really be researched about that. Exactly. Well, on a, on another uh, example of this, um, if you are, are mounting some magnets on a steel plate, uh, on a one eighth of a hinge steel plate, uh, the the magnets will double their their pull force. And this is an awesome phenomenon that I am not really sure to to understand. Because, but I think there's I think there's a relationship between the magnetic field and um, the pull force because you know if you have your one eight okay, correct me if i'm not right because it, the, this is our these are my thoughts uh, if i have the the magnetic shield like this and then i put a rare magnet on it the thickness if uh, over a certain thickness the magnetic field will be content between this space so to go from the from the north to the south pole they're going uh, to you know the they're they are closer than when the when the when on the magnet it's it needs to turn around the magnet to go back to the south pole so do you think it, this might be an explication on why on when mounted on a steel plate the pull force is uh, improved so it, so that's not an easy uh, question no 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 <laughs> it, a magnet in itself on its own is just an intimate ob object it it doesn't it just sits there mm -hmm. what a magnet needs to show its unique abilities or behavior is either a ferromagnetic material like iron or steel or a second magnet. So a two-part system. Whether you use a magnet with a magnet or a magnet with a ferromagnetic material, they basically have the same strength. Now, if you add a second ferromagnetic material with a magnet and a ferromagnetic material. I call that a three-part system. And yes, it doubles mostly mm -hmm. its strength. You can also do the same. There, there, there are different variations of those three yeah. parts. But yes, a three-part magnetic system uh, has more doubles most t the strength of one of one magnet so using two layers of ferromagnetic material in some respects you can have twice the holding power but at a lower cost so i just but want to remind yeah, I, I want to remind everyone that um, that Gwen has an amazing book, which you can purchase. <laughs> and if you are thinking about using magnets to mount anything, you should refer to Gwen's book because it is the best way to get a better understanding of, of what you're getting yourself into. And um, yeah i that's i highly recommend it so but i would like to wrap everything up for us right now so that we can go to live question and answers yes so thank you panelists and we'll see you 
in the real world in just a moment. Wonderful. That was really a f great to see the, the accumulated knowledge and all that uh, information. And now there are questions and we're going to pass this back to Sam and work on the questions for the next 10 minutes and then we'll move along. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you. That was just such a great guide on how to work with magnets. I learned so much. So thank you so much for that. Uh, the first question we have here from Mark is, could you please clarify something? Which kind of magnet can be used with hot glue and which kind shouldn't be? Um, it's really something you can look up at each of the permanent magnets have their own curry temperature as um, was mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and it just so happens that the other three permanent magnets have a much higher curry temperature than the neodymium. Um, and then they also in particular have the widest range between the maximum operator operating temperature and the um, curry temperature which is gradually as you move closer to the curry temperature, literally you lose all magnet, everything. Um, so like with Laura's technique uh, with the buttons, uh, it turns out ferrite or ceramic magnets have a, a, a curry temperature that's beyond uh, the use of um, hot, me hot melt glue. <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. John's got a question that says, please explain the difference between the types of magnets you've used. So how strong, how permanent, and what makes rare earth magnets different? Um, well, the, the beauty of rare earths is the size to strength ratio. Uh, many people uh, assume Maltby and uh, Heidi Mischk try, used uh, the ferrite magnets early on, on, but then the artifact had to be a sizable in order to fit the larger ferrodynamia. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm now com so confused. Ferrite magnet um, to get, have the strength. Plus, you had to manipulate the orientation in order to acquire enough strength for a heavier artifact. Um, it, for anyone who saw the window cleaning or the, those window cleaning ones that had the Alnico, um, because of the trade and economic situations of China and their monopoly, a lot of companies are really tr going backwards to the sort of technology that is sort of, um, they dusted off the cobwebs and now are really trying to make the weaker Alnico um, much stronger. So that's the Bro9 and why these window cleaners uh, could in essence have the enough strength uh, was because of this more, this newer technology that, that has been uh, done. Um, but it's the size, it's still, those four magnets that are inside the window cleaners are pretty big. Whereas, um, you know, the fish things with the neodymium are pretty small uh, with the same amount of pull force. Um, that was a lot of information, sorry. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> Um, there's a, a question here from Kevin and he says, what are any conservation drawbacks to using magnets? I think the, the most one is the compression and there are, there are different materials that are ranked by their ability to regain uh, their shape. And um, it turns out cellulose and so hence paper um, has a very low regaining uh, once it's been uh, compressed. So that's why paper conservators in particular are very uneasy about 
at least using magnets on the surface. Now, mind you, even if you mount a, a drawing or a work of art on paper, you know, you know this already because of the window mat. And you'll see that there's the outer edge of that drawing will be more compressed over time just because of the window mat. Um, so that's, you know, nothing really new, but that is, and also if you use, you, you don't really balance the strength of the magnet that you've selected with the delicacy of the artifact. So then you have a tendency to, um, um, you know, tears happen or that kind of thing. Thanks again, Gwen. Uh, there's a, a question here and a statement actually from Karen. Firstly, she's saying thank you for your demonstration of handling and the tool that reads polarity. She's asking, is there also another tool or way to read the strength of a magnet to know if it's losing its strength and to label properly by strength, like the tool used to test battery strengths? Uh, it's a Gauss meter. Um, it's a very specific tool and uh, very expensive also. Uh, I don't know if you have one, Gwen. Do you have one uh, under your desk or something like that? <laughs> No, I don't have a Gauss meter. Um, <laughs> but oftentimes at universities, um, that. Um, but the the other, just a low tech way, is just simply to use a a compass, and the the amount of swinging of the needle will give you an indication of the strength, and it's like a comparative. And if you just put it on a like graph paper, you can see at a certain point as you bring it further away, where at some point that needle no longer goes. Um, so that that the Gauss meter kind of does the same thing. It just sort of gives you a number. Um, but that's what I do. And and actually, they're especially with the packing and shipping and that kind of thing. If I have a group of of magnets and I'm trying to figure what size of box to make, the compass is really perfect for that. If the needle does not move, then you're set. That's brilliant. Um, Earl's got a question that says, what is the best way to keep magnets clean? I don't know, Pierre, wow. Well, once, how do you keep magnets clean? Yeah, you keep the, you keep them stored <laughs> because um, especially uh, when there's a lot of movement uh, inside a gallery or the, in a space, uh, even if you're not working metal around, they they will have some very small parts of metal that they will all stick on the magnet but um, to, it's a strange it's a hard to to answer a question because it, to keep a magnet clean it's all about the context on where they are okay thank you we might stick with Ellie. he's got just a couple more questions i'm going to group them together he's asking what about hazards with magnets especially around children and then he's also just wanting that confirmation that it's okay to use hot melt glue with magnets Um, well, I wouldn't use hot melt glue with the neodymium. Um, I'm, you know, yes, you can sort of cool it off. I don't know. It, that's just, it's better just not to bother. Um, but yeah, the, one of my favorite magnetic toys were those, um, you know, like the cube of balls and it went off the market because of um, of the hazards with children. Um, I th I think you just have to keep them stored and out of you know arm's reach, you know, on a high shelf. Thank you, Gwen. Um, Karen's asking a question around 
um, mounts, uh, magnets and mounting perhaps, you know, being able to be knocked or disturbed. And she's asking, has anyone used a combination of magnets with armatures for security? Yes. Uh, I, I did for uh, some silversmith, uh, silversmith pieces uh, that uh, we displayed uh, in our um, permanent galleries. Um, I, I had to make a mount, which is kind of uh, an arm and uh, a small deck uh, made of steel. And then uh, it was a mug uh, from uh, a silver mug with a small cavity underneath. And I made a kind of a, uh, an, ex an epoxy wedge with one magnet in it and then put the, the mug on it and after another magnet inside. But um, uh, in this case too, uh, I used, um, uh, I have difficult with this word, sweated poly, <laughs> um, uh, to have a, a barrier between the magnet and the, the silver. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Um, Francis is asking, is it possible to use magnets for mounting gold or silver objects? Any tips or solutions? Well, silver and gold are, aren't ferrite. So uh, there's, you know, if you're not using the magnet to stick it, stick like what Pierre Luc just said, if, you, if you're using two magnets in the way he did as a sandwich, um, that was that's a great solution, Pierre. Look for for that. Um, but right, silver and gold aren't going to have that magnetic. Something that Gwen said to us when we were recording, which I loved, was that that magnets. When a magnet is just sitting there, it's just it's just an you know it's just a thing. It doesn't. But when it, when you bring another magnet or a piece of steel into play with it. And then it, it becomes alive and it does what magnets do, which is be a magnet. And I just love that. And um, it makes me think about the materials that we're using around with magnets. I think that's, I, I just love that so much, Gwen. You're so yeah, sweet. it's a great analogy. <laughs> but yeah, gold and silver is our, the, the metals that are attracted to magnets are ferrite. A ferromagnetic para, like a, um, aluminum and stainless steel is para. And each of these is a, there's a group. Then there's dia, dia, dia uh, magnetic. And I believe that's what gold and silver is, but um, I'd have to look it out. But every metal is grouped by how it behaves um, in a magnetic uh, field. Perfect. Thanks, Gwen. We've got a question from Matthew and he's um, talking about how he's installed a show with magnets holding up lots of posters um, and the biggest challenge was separating the magnets while wearing nitrile gloves. Um, and he's saying, you know, it's difficult to do. The gloves got shredded at the fingertips um, and he loves your magnet dispenser and positioner, but with smaller magnets, finger positioning seems necessary. So he's asking, are there other tips for better methods? I believe that it's possible to use the Teflon wedge uh, to install small magnets on on the on the on some poster, even if they are very very small, because you can just position the the, the wedge on the right at the right place, and with the end of the wedge uh, in front of the other magnet that is underneath, and you just slide it slowly, and then they will stick together. It's even safer than arriving with the magnet in your hand and trying to put it in place. This could make a small shock or something like that. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, like wands with the magnet, either you can buy them or you could, you know, you know make them yourself um, that can be really helpful uh, for that. Um, Perfect. And we'll just have one more question and then I'll hand back over to Jamie. Um, someone's asking, what about storing them in plastic? I think Gwen should also answer to this one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, that's how I started uh, storing my magnets and I uh, lined them with thin ethafoam sheeting. Um, it's so 
um, so that was my first method before I then started um, putting them in the metal, metal uh, tins. Uh, but yeah, like the contact lens cases are really ideal for if, if you have a specific need of one magnet to be isolated from another magnet. Um, and that may be because that you've color coat, you toned one specific, you know, you camouflaged it for one particular location, whereas the other one for another location, um, that kind of thing. But yeah, plastic is, you know, it's great. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Jamie. Bye. Thank you, Sam, for keeping all that that moving. And thank you, Gwen and Laura and Pure Luke. Um, the magnets are an amazing thing. I just can't wait to see how they continue to develop as as the years go go by. 